15 to order. The clerk will please call the roll. Calling the roll, Mr. Miller. Here. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones is absent at the moment. Ms. Simon. Ms. Simon is absent at the moment. Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison is absent. Mr. Gallagher. Here. Mr. Schron. Here. Ms. Brown. Here. We have a quorum, and I'd like the record to reflect that Ms. Conwell, Ms. Baker, and Council President Brady are in attendance. Okay, great. Thanks for everybody for coming this afternoon. And do we have anybody signed in for public comment related to the agenda? No, Mr. Chair, no one has signed in. And the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the May 15th meeting. Those minutes are in your packet. Do we have a motion relative to those minutes? So moved. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes from May 15th. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the minutes are approved from May 15th. And let the record show that that uh, Vice President Jones is now in attendance. And we have no matters uh, referred to committee before we get into our major discussion for today. Just a programming note, we are expecting that uh, legislation for the Microsoft Enterprise Agreement is going to be introduced into next Tuesday's council meeting. And uh, presuming that occurs, we will then have our next meeting of finance and budget two weeks from today on the 19th at 1 o'clock at our regularly scheduled time slot. Our discussion item is the ERP project update. Cuyahoga County's Enterprise Resource Planning, or ERP project, is a $25 million comprehensive information technology upgrade. The project impacts a very wide range of county government activities, including accounting, budgeting, payroll, human resources, procurement, grants management, asset management, and statistical analysis, to name a few. The primary aim of the project is cr to create a seamless and integrated approach to these functions, rather than the siloed systems we have now that don't talk to each other. If successful, this upgrade will create a large operational savings, reduce time needed to complete projects and simplify them, and greatly expand our data capabilities. As with any complex IT system, the potential for de design flaws, cost overruns, and implementation delays are considerable, especially if the project has not been well designed. Because of the size and scale of this project and its large impact on county government, we decided that it would be desirable to have a quarterly update <coughs> and oversight session on the ERP project with this being the first meeting and continuing till the project is successfully implemented. In this session, we hope to learn about how the project is designed, how it will work, how it is being implemented, what unexpected problems or costs have arisen, and how and when operational savings and or enhanced performance capabilities will be achieved. I would prefer that questions generally be held until the end of the presentation, but if a question arises, it needs to be answered immediately to better understand the rest of the presentation, we can take it. Leading our presentation this afternoon will be Cindy Nappy, manager of the ERP project, and also Scott Rourke, director of information technology and, informa and innovation, will be available to answer questions. Ms. Snappy. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Councilman Miller, for that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to this um, presentation today. 
and having the opportunity to present again as our first, as uh, I think uh, Councilman Miller said, this will be the first of many to come. Since it is a prioritized project across the county, we want to make certain that we keep this um, committee up to date, as up to date as possible. And what we have here today on the agenda, because this is this initiative really started, what, five or six years ago, but truly became into, um, into a project and moving forward a little about over a year and a half ago. So we want to give you a little bit of a refresh with the agenda. So talking a little bit today on the historical perspectives, then we're going to talk about the project structure to uh, Councilman Miller's perspective, helping you to understand what we have put in place to make certain that things such as cost overruns, um, inappropriate uh, pr planning doesn't occur here. We're also going to talk about the scope and expectations and benefits, showing you some specific examples by some of the core departments involved in this project as to what one small thing can change and transform and make a significant impact for their departments. We're also then going to tell you where we are today, what is exactly is <clears throat> the status of the ERP project today, and then we're going to go over and review with you uh, a recap of the baseline project budget. And again, I, I say a recap of the baseline investment, um, because once we get to that, I'll certainly speak to to some of the numbers you may be scratching your head saying, how can, how can these numbers be? We're in June of 2017. How can we expend to, expect to expend so much between now and December 31st? So I'll be explaining those details as well. So from a historical perspective and um, just starting with the basics, what is an ERP? An inter ERP is an enterprise resource planning system, and basically that is an integration of not just your core, um, the core administrative functions of an organization, but it also is an integration of uh, reporting, analytics, metrics, everything that really it makes and drives business decisions and where you can have one system, one source for those data-driven decisions. So for us, we've, we are really, from a core perspective, the key departments are involved with this financials, procurement, human resources and payroll, public works. But that, even though it's just those departments implementing this, this is going to transform across the county and certainly um, benefit all employees. This next slide here is why did the county need um, a, a, an ERP? And Councilman Miller's uh, touched on a couple of items earlier in his speech, indicating we have such disparate, and that is separate systems today that don't talk to one another. Some of them have the same data or need the same data in them, so data sometimes is entered into multiple systems. So there's certainly time and resources to deal data dual data enter into multiple places. But the system say, since we don't talk to, to each other and their timing structure is different, in order to pull reports together, it is a manual effort in certain areas to pull a report from Brass as well as Famous, as well as SAP to get one report. And the, based on timing, we can estimate the accuracy of that data, but some of the data may be one week old, some may be two weeks old, some may be one week old. So really we are going to be able to improve this tremendously so that moving from this very siloed approach to an integrated approach where all of those business systems, business activities are within one system. So I call it the one source, that ERP home. And through that, that integration is already part of the product. It is um, real-time data. If somebody is entering in a budget, for example, a budget variance request, that may be a very different process in the ERP than it is today. Something that gets to um, uh, Office of Budget Management much, much more quickly, and having those details in their hands helps to, to expedite and move through their, their processes um, quickly as they can. So HR, same type of experiences as well, having that integrated time collection, payroll, and human resources system really helping us to, to drive some of those analytics, the reports, um, and interfaces where we need to be interfacing with either third-party vendors or uh, at a stat state and federal level. 
Getting to this point, getting to this ERP initiated was a long process here. The county did quite a bit of due diligence, but everything involved in this project included the authorization of the bond, which many of you who were there at that time um, may remember this. We also last year I engaged a third party vendor to help us look at our original requirements and really go out to market with a best and final offer. We engaged the internal selection committee, which were the chief levels of, across the, um, the core supporting departments and their leads. Also hire, uh, made the final selection process at that time. I think it was May 15th or May 16th of last year. And so then hiring my role into this um, mixture completing the vendor negotiations as well as getting a, a, the um, finance committee and council uh, authorization to move forward. The project then officially kicked off in mid of uh, December of last year. So a lot of activity to really bring this off of a back burner, so to speak, bring it to the forefront and really start organizing and planning around it. One of the first things we did really with this team and with this um, product is to say, what does the county from an outcome perspective, what do, what do we expect out of it and what is the brand? What does this ERP brand? Instead of calling it the ERP for the next 10 years, what do we want to not only reference to the project, but what does the output, what is the gain for the county? And we had a little bit of a, a help in brainstorming around this and a little bit of a contest too. But the key components that came out of what is the end result for this project and what is it going to accomplish? It's going to drive results. It's going to implement innovation. It's going to add value and efficiencies. So drive is our branding term that we are using for this project. So going forward, you'll see that quite a bit, particularly as we start our communications broadly out to the um, all of our employees in the next uh, month. From a project structure and a governance perspective, we do have a core steering team. This steering team is comprised of the key um, owners and stakeholders of these deep departments. Fiscal, so that is Dennis Kennedy uh, for fiscal and procurement. For public works is Mike Dever. For um, HR, human resources, is Douglas Dykes. And for IT is Scott Rourke. We also have Matt Carroll and Sharon um, uh, Sobel Jordan sitting on the steering team to represent the executive office. So quite a, quite a hefty leadership team. We do meet weekly and we have dashboard reporting. That dashboard reporting contains many items that this team is responsible for truly um, they are the guidance, the structure, and the decision makers here. So the dashboard, uh, dashboard reporting includes things such as the weekly budgets, any weekly budget asks, the spent to date, any type of staffing issues or concerns, any type of um, issue where it may be posing a roadblock to a portion of the project or team members, and they help to remove those roadblocks. And also just pure open discussion, how we're collaborating across these departments, these core departments for this initiative. They are our escalation points. So that is what any issue that can't be resolved at the project level or at the director level definitely moves up to this steering team as well. Very engaged, um, uh, very much um, aware and becoming more aware each meeting as to the breadth and the depth of this initiative. We also have a core team project, and that core team project is really comprised of all of the leads, the team leads from each of those business areas. So for example, for fiscal, we have Angela Rich, we have Amy Hemmeline, we also have Chris Murray, we also have um, Maggie Keenan. So certainly the, the full leadership there. We have from um, Public Works, we have Mike Chambers, we have um, Anthony Forensic. From HR, we have all of the uh, Douglas's leadership team, Hollywoods, Melissa Feldesi, Matt Kelly, Pat Smock, 
um, Ray Dean Brown and Deborah Johnson. So we have a very strong leadership group who are really organizing their their teams, but also identifying working with their subject matter groups. Now the core team also meets weekly, but they are more on a tactical project level discussion. So task by task on the project plans, where are we at on the project, what is on time, what is due up for this week or next week, what may be tardy or late, what do they need to get to get any late tasks up to speed, etc. So lots of discussions and we handle a lot of communications. <clears throat> As some of you may be aware, word of you know the ERP has gotten out through the county. So there's a water cooler talk, there's a speculation going on. But really, this, this team is where that stuff happens, where it helps bubble up to, to not only this core team, but also to the steering team. And that's allowing us to really <clears throat> incorporate in, uh, those types of concerns into our awareness and uh, communications planning. The next slide I have is just as far as what does this organizational structure look like? This is the org chart that really shows at the top level the steering team, the project management office, the um, core teams involved and engaged in this, the leads as, long as, as well as subject matter experts and key topics for under each of those business umbrellas. I know it's a little challenging to see some of the print, but uh, I'll be happy to send you something much, um, much larger if that will work for you. Any questions on the org structure before I move off? Yes. That's my try. On the um, steering committee, how many of those folks have actually done an ERP conversion? Good question. So we have um, Dennis Kennedy has ERP experience. Scott Rourke has ERP experience, as does Douglas Dykes. So we do have a, a good representation of ERP experience on that team. I would assume that, I actually did assume that uh, Scott had it, uh, being, uh, that, was, that, that was a given, sorry about that. Uh, the other folks in the operational side though, uh, this is their first exposure then with it? Yeah, my understanding tip. is it's the first exposure, but the, ironically, um, they are very up to speed with what is happening and what's transforming right now. Okay, and then how about on the core business team, same question? Core business team, same thing. Not just exposure, but experience. We have a little, a little experience, a little exposure. And who is that? So uh, my understanding is from a fiscal perspective, uh, Angela Rich has uh, ERP experience from a prior uh, employment. Anybody else? I believe that may be it. The exception is on the HR team. So on the HR team with Douglas Dyke's um, newer management team, uh, Matt Kelly, uh, Melissa Fuldesi, Holly Woods, most of them have had ERP experience. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that you, your voice drop. Most of them do or do not? Do. Most of Douglas Dyke's leadership team have that type of experience. They've, they've been part of an ERP? Correct. So that would be uh, his talent management manager today, his benefits and compensation team and leadership team, they have the, uh, the prior ERP experience. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Ms. Conwell. Uh, through the chair, um, will this drive system have any capacity to talk with the prosecutor's office, the systems with that, as well as judicial? Very good question. And we have a list of um, interfaces that we had included as part of this project and the statement of work. I will, for next time, either follow up with you directly and the committee with whether or not those are on that list or whether or not they would be additional scope. But the intent was to, to have those on. But I'll just confirm that for you. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, please continue. All right. So from a scope and an expectation perspective, 
Uh, just as a quick reminder too, this project has been broken up into two phases. The phase one is really focused on our foundational components of the software. You build the foundational components on which everything else is built around it. Since we have you know, one chart of accounts, one uh, accounting codes, one set of accounting codes, so we really have to make certain that we, we have that foundational structure in place before we continue to add more modules on. And so that is the approach we're taking. Phase one is, um, as you can see here, is fiscal procurement and public works, and lots of transformation expected during that, not just with the system, but really eliminating that manual processes and pro procedures. Public works is heavily manual today. Paper, paper, more paper, spreadsheets, et cetera. So really having the benefit of removing the manual processes, procedures, eliminating the paper, um, having access to real-time data once it's in the system. If your role has access to that data, you can see it. So that's certainly going to be transformative for them, them as well as improved analytics. The analytics and with the, the system has drill down uh, um, capabilities as well as standard reports to the capacity that we don't have currently. So certainly many capabilities in uh, how to slice and dice and learning how to look at our data as refined as we need or as high level as we need. And then some of the current legacy lengthy process times based on workflow and the automation of the system, we're really expecting a reduction, significant reduction in processing cycle times. On the um, future state of uh, phase two, rather, we've got human resources, benefits, and payroll. Again, fully integrated with the financial system, fully integrated with each other, right? So even today, HR and PRC don't have the same system. They are not integrated for that front end of the hiring system. So we are really, really looking forward to getting those, even those on the same system. Again, fully integrated. Um, manager and employee self-services, that allows employees and managers both to, to service their customers much more easily and reliably. From a talent management perspective, particularly for phase two, it's going to allow us to really um, move that applicant to employee life cycle and employee to retiree life cycle in one system and see those transactions progress over time. So it's really allowing our, as an employer, allowing us to expand our capabilities in performance management, link that to training and training management, as well as linking that to succession planning so that we are really approaching our staffing, um, not just hiring differently, but approaching our employee, our employee development, our employee growth, and uh, advancement opportunities so that they have a career here, not just a job. So we're really looking at those transformative items. All right, and I think we've we've talked quite a bit already on the the expectations. Again, one source, streamlined processes, self surface capabilities, and that greater enhanced um, cycle time, but also user experience. The um, what what I don't want to have shortchanged here as well is this user experience is going to be so different compared to what our employees use today. It's going to, I expect in, in my experience that there's a, a love and a hate, and a love and a hate with the process as we go through it. It's going to be so different to put something in a system versus on paper and rekeying something in. But once we are, are focused on training, our communications effort with our employees, training the people on how to do their jobs within the ERP, getting them extremely comfortable, um, and having their support all the way through implementation, we will certainly, I think there'll be such a difference between day one and uh, day 365 um, by the time we get there. But certainly it's a, it's a future, future state, uh, but we will get there. Okay, I have questions. Sure. Uh, Councilman Tran. Thank you. Uh, going back to the scope, phase one, uh, by the sound of phase one, it must have a beginning and a and an end to it. Um, what's the uh, go live date on phase one? So phase one target date for go live is 
First quarter 2018. First quarter 2018. 2018 correct. Okay, so uh, are we talking first quarter of, uh, of calendar year or fiscal year or what are we, what are we calendar talking? Calendar year. Okay, so March of 2018 is, is still first quarter, I assume? Correct. Okay, so Correct. Uh, just knowing that I've, I've done ERPs and you don't measure yep. it based on dates, you measure it on quarters, and so Correct. we go live in the first quarter, that's January to March. Is, Correct. Is that, is that a, okay. That is correct, and that's a good question because, and it's a good point, with a project of this scope and this measure, it's definitely um, ebbs and flows. We are quicker on certain tasks than others and a little slow on others, so certainly focusing on a quarterly uh, implementation date is the, is the key. And then phase two? Phase two, we are already kicking that off as of this month. So we are kicking off with the basic current state requirements and we roll out. I do have a, um, I'll show you right here. I'll go to the slide. You can see oh, our- If we're right. gonna get to that, that's okay. okay. Well, okay. I, I can wait. Yeah, I, sure. It just looked like it was asking for us to, to figure out one phase two and phase one. If you're gonna cover that later on. I'd... I put it in a different spot, but I, right here it is. So for phase two, which is the brown color here, we're kicking that off in June of this month. And the core HR modules are focused on core three of 2018, but we are also staggering for workforce management, which is time and attendance and um, workforce planning to roll out that same Q3 2018, and then talent management, which is the hiring performance management to roll out in Q4 of 2018. Okay, so 2018, three quarters of those phase two is gonna be December 31st is, uh, is last phase of it, if I'm understanding the Correct. That chart. Okay, we so can I, look at it that and, way, yes. And I didn't mean to get ahead of it if you. That's okay. Um, but on issues that, that I, I don't know if they're covered, under fiscal uh, phase one, the question as far as, does that include the economic development loans that are in question uh, at this point in time? And is that being uh, incorporated into the fiscal area or is that moving over to economic development? Uh, or where is that residing? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm gonna to defer to Scott on that because he's been much more involved in that component than I am. Okay, and then when you go live with phase one, there's always a controversial discussion on ERPs. Do you run simultaneously with the backup system or do you go a hard cutoff and start and stop with uh, the old system went away today and the new one starts tomorrow? Or do you run on a parallel basis? Are we planning on doing which? So with respect to going live on implementation, we will not be sunsetting the, what, the existing currency legacy systems at the exact date that we go live, but those systems will be turned to view access only so that there are no transactional activities okay. in there. We have to make certain that we're not transacting in two separate systems. But we are also part of the conversion. We are converting balances for up to two years into the Enforce system so that there is a historical perspective. We also have identified and will be identified open racks, open POs, all of those types of things that we know we will have to blend in as well and roll over as part of that conversion. So we fully expect to be moving the legacy systems to a read-only uh, versus a transactional uh, system versus running parallel. But you're actually stopping hard on whatever that day is. You're not running a parallel system as a backup, is what it sounds like, on either phase one or phase two. Correct, of either that's one. not okay. part of the plan. That's fine, it, it, it's yeah. two different ways of going about it. I was just curious as to which way you're, you're going about it. Thank you. Sure. If I may go back to your question on economic development. Sure. The, for, uh, for the interim solution, we're trying to leverage, you, you may know they've got a software package called Portful. So we're right now working on a variety of workarounds, but we're trying to leverage the existing software as the ERP project will not be ready in time to support the short-term needs. Um, Long-term, the answer is yes, the, that will be inherent in the ERP. As far as who the business ownership is, I can't say to um, what their plan is going forward on whether that, uh, which part finance will own and what part economic development will own, but as it relates to the functionality and the reporting and um, all of that will be incorporated in the ERP once it's live. 
Okay, but who owns what, which means who owns the training and who owns that responsibility and who owns the maintenance? That's when will we know that? Because I know it's a controversial area right this moment on the year on the loans. I would have to get back to you on that answer. It's a good question. Okay, all right. And then um, succession planning under HR, that by itself, by using those words, means that there is a transitional workforce strategy someplace. Um, by using succession planning means that there is a transitional workforce strategy. Has that been published someplace that we could see what that succession workforce strategy is? So that's a good question, and Douglas will be the perfect person to explain it, but he's looking at succession planning, my understanding of it, is as we go forward. So when we have employees that we've identified that they're ready for management positions, we still need to not necessarily hire somebody externally for their role, but who is next in line that we could promote? Maybe as as Scott's being promoted to the next level, how do they get me ready if they've identified me as ready to step into his role? How do they get me ready? So if that's a succession planning to help us look at promotional opportunities, training opportunities, and more leadership opportunities from within. The other piece of succession planning is we have um, you know, a retiree plan that people can make a decision and, and they're gone, and they may be the only individual who has ever done that position for years. And so how do we are, prepare ourselves and position ourselves to have somebody within that department who knows what that person does and who's qualified enough and trained enough to be able to step in when that retiree leaves. So those are standards. Succession planning is typically standards for most organizations for position um, changes, position promotions, and you know people decide to leave, they win the lottery, they retire. It, it really, your su succession plan is who are, you, who are you building the leaders of tomorrow? So that's written down someplace that we can see? Uh, you know, we can ask Douglas if it's written down someplace. I would certainly hope so. <laughs> Yeah, it becomes planning, planning once it's written down. It, it becomes mm -hmm. something other than planning if it's if it's still conceptual. But I, I guess I'll probe one step deeper. If, if succession planning, which you have on here, is part of phase two, does that also mean uh, succession of the jobs and the job that some of which might be transitioned out? Because I can only assume we're going to be doing new things than what we did in the past uh, by this, and so the needs and are going to change and maybe even the workforce is going to change. Is that what you mean by succession planning also? Well, not really so, but, but you're absolutely right. It could come into play under that. The Is that written? As far as what would... What could be, be part of what you just responded to? Not yet. We're, we're really not there yet in each of the levels of the project. So what is, uh, and I'm guessing you're, you're asking staffing levels. So where we're at in the project is at the beginning. Now, each of the business teams that are going to go through this cycle <clears throat> will come to a point after the, the, they've made their decisions for design of the ERP, and it is put into a mock-up, and they see and they define that that's exactly what they want their setup to look like. Then after that process, that's when our consultant and for um, consulting, we'll be presenting to each of the departments, to Douglas, to Dennis, to, to Mike, what, uh, or what an organizational structure based on the design of the Infor should look like. And it will be up to Douglas and Dennis and Mike to look at that and say, what is the impact to our department? Is there any impact? Is it an improvement? Uh, are there any changes need, needing, or do we re- have opportunity for repurposing individuals. So we're looking at it as you know, repurposing, likely, as well as some people may decide that this isn't what they want to do, and through attrition, some people may choose to leave. You, you indicated you had three, maybe six, three to six people in the two different sections that came with ERP experience. Mm -hmm. Did they provide any guidance as to what they think historically would be achieved uh, in this area that we're talking to when you go through a whole process like this? Did they give a range? I'm not asking for fixed programs, sure. but did they sit down at the 30,000 foot level and say, you should expect that X is gonna happen as a result of a successful implementation? So none of the, the department leaders 
that will be making those decisions has formally done that and provided it to the ERP. We're just not there in the plan yet. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome Ms. Simon to the meeting. And are there anything else at this point? Seeing none, we'll uh, go back to where we were and ask Ms. Cindy to continue. Okay. <coughs> Here we go. All right, so I'm on slide 15, and I wanted to point out the focused, effective, and accountable leadership. This is another output of this, and you probably are used to seeing these words because they come directly from our charter. And it's really what, um, what this transformation project is leading us to, particularly as leadership, which is data-driven decisions. The data is much more readily available, available on a timely basis and allowing our leadership to make decisions with rapidity to resolve issues or address a strategic plan item much more rapidly. Also one source, this really cuts down on quite a bit of confusion, quite a bit of mixed information or details or competing details or information, what's in one system versus another. And then it really, really aligns our people, our processes, and our technology. So this is the first time the county is really looking at addressing something this enormous and this impactful to people, processes, and technology uh, at this level. So we're not, that's not lost on us as a team. It's certainly something we talk about quickly and, and rapidly because change management efforts around this transformation are extremely critical. That includes communications planning, awareness planning, training, additional training, follow-up training. It really addresses and has to address everything that's transpiring through this project that's going to impact all of our employees at different levels. So our transformation, we're looking at it as deliberate. It's fundamentally going to change the way and how we process work and purposely, we are actually consciously and purposely making these changes. So any questions on that? I have just one question. Sure. Uh, under, under the prior administration, we had county stat, which was used for some decision making. But by and large, the uh, the council did not have access to most of the information. Uh, are we going to have access to all of this uh, additional planning data that, that you're going to be generating so that, so that we can intelligently participate in the decision-making process? Well, that's a great question. So the, the, the application is roles-based, right? And roles can be having few ac full access, full um, capability to make changes, but uh, what I'll do is I don't know, Dale, what the thought is yet with respect to usability for the council, but certainly I'll bring that back to the next um, meeting to let you know, is it a role, so you, which role you would have, if one, to um, see the details in the, in the system. Are there particular roles or details that you look for that you need that you don't have today? It'll be a continuing discussion. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right, so on business case outcomes, there was a business case created through the last, um, last year in preparation for this project, which was really focused on five key areas, integration, accountability, transparency, measurability, and accuracy. And I know we've gone over these again repeatedly, but really the transformation that it, that integration is going to be uh, so transformative that we can't underestimate what that means and the impact of that to, um, to daily outcomes. Data accuracy, again, we've spoken to that. That's going to be critical as well. The, the advantage that we're going to get, though, out of some of these, the transparency, the measurability, the accuracy, as far as the analytics and metrics to really deep dive, um, dive in, at every level of detail, slice, dice, um, show numbers in a different flavor, 
however we need it, however we need it at a summary level as well as a detailed level. So certainly I think you're going to have and start seeing much more available to you, um, at least what's brought here to you through the, uh, through the presentations. Councilman Tron. Just one, I don't see productivity improvement on there. That's historically something you would see on a ERP system. It's yeah, actually on the next slide. You've got it. You're absolutely right. Productivity for at both the individual and the management level on slide 18. So as we move from uh, even at the employee level, having once they have access to the data, once they have faster processing time of entering something into one system and improved customer service, there's their activities are happening online versus paper. And then you can see even from a managerial level, we've got that real-time data, analytics tools and improved um, productivity, faster approvals, increased ability to support staff and constituents is there as well. As far as integration, accountability, transparency, and accuracy, all of that, uh, the faster improvement cycle times and performance is part of all of that. All of those are going to be precursors to getting that performance improvement. Any other questions before I move on? So uh, a couple of the departments wanted to use uh, some examples specific to what they expect to receive improvement. Public Works was one of their, um, one of the departments that really expects to show significant improvement for their work, work um, effort. And uh, sanitary is an area where they currently support as a department in over 30 communities. But what happens today is uh, those teams are dispatched in a truck or a car and they are going to an area um, given to them through dispatch details of the issues and situations are are put on paper and when they arrive they are also adding to that paper they're assessing what's going on they're assessing what needs to happen does anything need to be purchased in order to resolve that they are really um, very paper intensive and then that crew gets in the truck and goes on to the next site and the next site and the next site so the bottom line is sometimes those documents, those papers, are not turned in um, immediately. Sometimes there's a lag, a day, could be a week. Therefore, the turnaround time to get back out to those communities to resolve an issue lags behind, certainly due to the paper approach. So there are um, delayed customer service, delayed um, impact of resolving a, a customer or constituent problem. In the ERP, what they're looking at is when uh, their crews are dispatched to the area, they will have handhelds where they are actually entering in what their assessment is, what the potential needs are into the system by that handheld. It's read immediately. It's back at the office. There's nobody waiting for them to deliver paper, or nobody else having to key in the details from that paper. So it's really showing that data in real time, and the end result expected is to have those um, be able to prioritize what are those issues out in those communities, how can they get the product if they need to purchase it, how do they get the purchased uh, more rapidly and fixed and resolved much more quickly. Okay, Ms. Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is ironic that you bring this up because I had a, a situation on my street that correlates to the public work system and the the situation called for additional paperwork and it would require them to come back out to an area that they were already at. So one of the things I'm curious about um, with the new, with the future process is um, will their systems be iPad or tablet driven and will they allow for um, imaging such as videos and, and pictures to be taken to, to also um, be included in their uh, paperwork? All great questions, and those are the discussions that we're just starting because there are options. So it's got to be durable, it's got to be heavy duty, but really what are the capabilities? So we're just starting those dialogues to look at what products will pr allow them to do a majority, if not all, of those components. And I guess with um, another thing I th think should be um, perhaps considered is the um, 
the individuals that will be utilizing this, they're more, as you uh, said, in paper driven. So will there be some training or will this be drop down menus because transitioning from writing information to typing out um, detailed reports was also can be time timely um, if you haven't been in the habit of doing that. So you, you know, you are absolutely right. And we have been talking at the change management uh, initiative. We actually started off to say, we know we have to train on the ERP and communicate it, but what are the basic skills that some of our employees may need that before they can actually utilize this product? So we even look, we've been looking at is it typing skills? Is it knowing how to open up windows? Is it knowing how to uh, use a handheld? What is a list of values? So we've already started identifying what are those components so that we can address those up, those pockets of people so that they get the right training at the right time. So uh, absolutely, you're, you're thinking in alignment with what, what we're looking at now. Okay. Great. So another example is um, the hiring process from the applicant and application engagement through HR. Currently, we have a number of applicants that use and apply for jobs on our website. And uh, until they hear from somebody, they really have no idea where their position, <clears throat> where their application is in the process. Um, they typically will hear either if they're rejected, if they're uh, or if they're added to a list or they need to come for testing, but it can take quite some time once they apply to, to really hear from us. It's also challenging because some of the applicant processes and paper are across multiple systems. So we've got applicant tracking here in HR, but we also have a lot of the front end applicant processes in PRC. So that is challenging. What I've learned in, in meeting with both of those teams is there is a lot of manual um, emails, phone calls, uh, weekly or daily sometimes, just to learn status of what is happening with applicants or a, a hiring process. So it's very manually and person intensive right now. So we certainly have a, a challenge with contacting to contacting to our applicants, making certain that they have awareness that they're still in the still in the, the game. Uh, also, the spreading of the details and the information across two systems and two departments can take that, you know, add to the length of time for that process. What we're looking at in the future is that the applications, applicants, once they um, apply, will have visibility to where their application is anywhere in the process. Has it been reviewed? Is it with the hiring manager? Even some of the basic list, litmus tests <coughs> to see and keep them aware that they're still in the game, or did they receive a rejection letter? Um, we will definitely also have one system, so the the back and forth of phones and emails, uh, that manual effort that PRC and HR go through today will be reduced, having to, making certain that some of the criteria is already built into the system. It can be automated and that they are working same place um, and jointly seeing that flow much more fluidly. And we have a question, and it's from Ms. Brown. Okay, and with the, to that point, the PRC's involvement, what are, are they a part of the team, or I, I didn't hear um, any of their names included in the the list that you mentioned earlier. My, so what's, my what mistake, I, can, I include them under HR, but PRC is, and we have had joint meetings with um, PRC and HR, the PRC leadership, Rebecca and her, t her leadership team, as well as Douglas and his. And um, they are going to actually be going through this front end of the process, this phase two, jointly. Um, I was just with Rebecca and her um, leads again a couple of weeks ago, just with the status update. And then now in the next two weeks, we'll be bringing Rebecca and um, Douglas's teams back together jointly so that we can plan for our kickoff. So there's definitely joint dialogues and individual dialogues, but they're going through this process, that whole front end. Um, particularly when it comes to talent together. Okay, please continue. Okay. Our current status for our project. So this is um, a list I wanted to tell you by phase where we are at and what does this really, really mean. So right now, while we kicked off in December, we really got underway at the end of January, beginning of February 
First, by establishing and following, following the impact methodology from INFOR and the um, looking over and establishing our project governance, getting our um, business teams organized and resource loaded. From a technology perspective, we, we've also gone through and our INFOR environment has been stood up, which means it's now up from a testing and a development of production. Um, mode not usable for production or, or testing yet, but at least we have them uh, available and we're able to start developing what this will look like uh, in the future as we move into the build state. From a current business process review, all of that has been concluded for fiscal procurement and public works which was a great deal of time of sitting down with multiple people across the county as well as these core departments to figure out what is our end-to-end -end processing for submitting a requisition, for receiving a good, for um, a requesting a check. So we have went end-to-end, -end, so spent quite a bit of time there. And what we moved into was what, from that, as, which is our current state, we moved into core team training. And that core team training is very critical for our team to understand what does the product do, what can it do, how does it do it differently than what we do today, and how do we implement it? What type of decisions Dennis and his team and Douglas and his team and Mike and his team will need to make as they're moving through this ERP. So it's really, really um, time consuming. And I'd say roughly when I take, we've trained people, when it comes to the fiscal training, we have spent uh, roughly 4,200 hours training our internal team. For procurement, we spent roughly 1,680 hours training our internal team. And today we kicked off training for our public works team. So we are upfront putting a significant investment in our staff education to learn this product and get a better understanding of the impact that it can have within their departments. So that's, that's a critical component, which leads us to the next phase, which is um, getting there. Uh, to be or future state planning created and reviewed. So any questions on that first piece of financial procurement? Ms. Conwell. I just want a clarification. When you moved down to the core team training, you did mention public works, but it just wasn't listed as a bullet point. It, it so. will be on the next sheet because we are just initiated it today. Okay. So it's actually on the top of the next slide 25, where what's in process for uh, phase one. Gotcha. How many we, hours were so far since you just started? It was like started a week ago or something like that. How many hours has been implemented for public work so far? So public work started today at today. noon. So we oh, okay. are about an hour and a half into okay. it today. Gotcha. Now also, Public works teams, some of the public works team were involved in the financial and the procurement testing as well so that they understand where their intersection and integration puts. But uh, specific public works training for their enterprise asset module starts today. So in our next quarterly, I'll have the, the number of hours for that as well. We are also working for phase one, uh, initiating not only the, uh, the final training, but our conversion strategy, our test strategy, our communications awareness uh, campaign, and the fiscal future state. There are two B processes, which will move right into their conference room pilot. So conference room pilot has been scheduled as well, and that, that activity is basically a mock-up of INFOR based on the decisions that the business teams moved through up until that point. During that conference room pilot, that's where, during and after, that's where the configuration and setup will be solidified, and that's where the impact of those solidified configurations and setup will result in the full value and review of policies or procedures that need to change to might be modified to address the new um, structure within the system. So any questions on that process? 
You just mentioned the policies and procedures that need to change. Um, since you're starting it, you don't really know if there's going to be a significant. Um, so will we be, the council be updated on if there's some uh, great policy changes or procedure changes that we're, we're used to? Yeah, great question, and absolutely. So the the business teams, the core teams, will know that first, vetting that out with our consultant team. That will then, if, if how significant or small, goes to the steering team so that there's full governance and, and buy-in and agreement that that definitely needs to happen. And then based on, is it a procedure that happens that's there? Is it a policy? Is it a process? What level of escalation uh, the item has to go to? So it'll move through the whole governance process through the project. Council will be notified of those. My understanding for those that are relevant that make sense that that require that, you know, those items will be brought. And I know you say required of that, but that some of us have been here for you know, a while, or we've even previously worked here, and there's certain policies and procedures. And so, since we're closer in touch with the residents uh, in the county that ask us questions and, and things of that nature, I just would just automatically assume that if there was any major policy or procedure changes, that we're giving the correct information to those individuals. because. For one, if a, a resident doesn't get what they need from reaching the administration, we're the next line of defense that they reach out to. So I would just like to yeah. be able to present, you know, the correct information in regards to, you know, this is massive, <laughs> like right. Councilwoman Brown, sewer. You know, they come they come to us about a lot of issues because they want to they want that correct answer right then. And so I just. So now I understand a little yeah. bit more of what you're talking about. So from a, a perspective, the awareness of policies, provisions uh, that need to be changed and that are changed are, are part of that overall communications plan to be pushed out to, throughout the county. So yes, so you know those that need to be trained on them because they're impactful for their jobs, those that need to be have awareness of them because their jobs require them to direct constituents to one direction or the other, that yeah, it's, it's not going to be hidden. Those policies versus provisions are definitely going to be shared with those who work in it and need to, to know how it is going to change. The, uh, the communications process as we're moving through the change management process is um, iterative. So starting small and then increasing what level of information as decisions are made, as awareness is, is brought to the folks to really explain it and expose it to them on an incremental basis. So by the time we go live, they've heard it for months, they're aware of it, and when they get in their training, they're not being surprised by, oh, this changed. They're hearing about it all through the process. So hopefully, does that answer your question yes. better? Okay. Uh, I would add that significant policy changes, especially those that affect the general public, would have to go through the administrative uh, rules board which, which is a public process, and, and it would be a, be a way of uh, uh, both becoming informed of it and also of having input. Uh, question from Councilman Tron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I assume that with some of this that you're talking about, policies and decision tree, uh, are just data collection type techniques. That you, how, how are you going to put it in? Are you going to dip this? Are you going to turn this dip switch on, or are you going to turn this one off? And which way is it going to go? Is that is that, is that is that correct, Scott? Scott? We're, we're not. When you're saying policies, ultimately there's going to be a policy on: do we load this data first and then this one, or do we do this activity first? And somebody's going to have to make those kind of policy decisions. decisions. That, that I think is at least what I understand. What I'm hearing as far as part of that. But getting to that, is there a decision tree written down as to how you go about those? Uh, decisions as to do we go and turn on the zero or the one on this particular uh, opportunity and as far as collecting it. And if it is written down, where does ultimately that decision thought go? Does it go to the steering committee? Does it go to the core business committee? Who makes the decision? And are you getting the operator input in their real life uh, operations at this point in time before you flick, flick those switches on? Because it's 
Yeah, great question. So how it's built today and what the structure is, is the subject matter experts, and those are typically the people who are hands-on doing right. the de processes, That's, right? They, aren't the, they generally are not the they're. steering or the core business unit. Right, but they are the hands-on, and that's who we have started with from the beginning because they are hands-on with what's happening today. They're going to need to be hands-on with what's happening tomorrow. So they are coming along through this training, through the operational component. They're going to be seeing the uh, future state, they're going to be seeing and participating in that um, conference room pilot because they're the outcomes, they need to know what their outcome is. They're the ones who, who are boots on the ground to know that. So we're bringing them in as part of the, the whole process. But when it comes to where are their decisions for configuration that says if you go right. A, a cash basis versus accrual basis, right? Those are decisions, right. right? When it goes there, our leads certainly have the, the feedback and Garrett Garner feedback from within the department, other key departments as well. Talking then to the chief, a fiscal officer, who then brings it back to the steering team for that discussion and that, that decision as to what that path should be. Okay, that, Same that's, thing would happen for any of the other um, steering team members. That's what I was understanding by policy decisions as far as what you just described. Mm -hmm. Is that written down as to the steps? Because those are major things. You see even that middle example you just gave, accrual sure. versus cash, that will drive so much of the activity and decisions for this entire right. government that someplace it's got to be written down and it has to be able to follow that path as to where it goes. Well, who made the decision? Who had right. the overwrite decision? Who had the overruling right. decision? And where does it go? Right. We have it written down. We created that as part of our statement of work as far as the decision, the escalation process. And then we have presentations and notes from each of our meetings so okay. that we can document those things. That's. Could you provide just that policy? Sure. You that, that process? That yeah. process of where just we that, go? Because that, that describes everything that goes on ultimately with the ERC piece packet. That's the governance process. Yep. Okay, we'll get that information and uh, please proceed. All right. We've well, gotten through phase one. Phase two is human resources. This is HR benefits, talent management, payroll, time collection, as I mentioned earlier. PRC and HR are partnering particularly on that talent management component. Right now, they've completed their first um, set of required documents and deliverable documents as the questionnaires about how do they transact business today. And then we are right now, um, they are completing their resource planning, which is identifying who their subject matter experts will be for each topic and where their time allocation needs to be spent over the life cycle of the project, as well as pulling additional um, business um, processes, procedures, documentation, and more questionnaires uh, in preparation for their phase one current business review. What we are planning right now and in planning is phase two kickoff so that we can um, get that rolling this month. Any questions on phase two? Question, questions on phase two? Okay. On to consultant update. Yes, I wanted to provide you with this consultant update because this is a change since we were last in front of the finance committee. We actually purchased the Infor software through Infor Public Sector Incorporated. And they had partnered, Infor had partnered with a consulting firm who handled most of their, the Infor government practice implementations of the Infor product. And that was a company that was called Cyber. And many of you met some representatives from Cyber and Infor last year when we were in front of you before. However, in March of 2017, Infor purchased Cyber's Infor consulting practice. And that was finalized, I believe, the last day in March. And we, the county, have received a request from Inform and Cyber to assign the rights and obligations under the Cyber Master Services Agreement, um, assign those over to Inform. So our um, legal team has been working on this, has taken a look at it, and uh, has recommended moving forward with completing this assignment request. So basically you're telling us that 
Where previously we had two partners, we now have one partner. That is correct. Okay. On that same point, Mr. Miller, so we also previously would have had a third-party independent person giving us advice as to the in four, and now it's the fox and the chicken coop. It could be looked at that. Uh, we could look at it from a, Sorry, a little bit different. <laughs> well, there's, a, there's advantages to having there one is. organization. I, I, I so when, you know, when I look at it and I say, what, what do we gain? because now we have direct access to Infor development team, which you don't always have through a third party. So our leeway to ask, instead of asking a cyber, hey, get a development person on the phone about this product, we can go direct. So we certainly have a, bro a broader range of services that Infor provides that we can benefit from. So there are two sides of that coin but there's certainly um, some advantages as well. But we no longer have anybody who's going to say, this vendor is telling us X, and they're not telling us uh, that you're, you're pushing back because they're both party of the same same organization now. So you don't, you don't have that independent third party telling us, hey, this is giving you some stuff that maybe is not correct, or they're, they're stretching uh, their performance expectations. Yeah, and you know, we are you going to be utilizing our business, our partners much more on that. So Sherwin Williams has been one of our partners who was very helpful through us, uh, with us through the whole contracting cycle. Uh, Metro Health, who has had uh, the Infor products um, for quite some time, and who now is running as of recently on the same county footprint, same type of Infor product and applications we're running. Uh, we are joining forces together there as well, both on knowledge base and um, lessons learned, but also on influence to the vendor and uh, that pushback jointly. So based we're certainly on, looking at those as a opportunities. Based as well. on those two comments about Sherwin Williams and uh, Metro, is there a users group here in town already that uh, we're part of? There's a users group, uh, a Midwest users group, um, but it's not in Cleveland. But uh, right. yes, there is a Midwest users group that we have uh, participants in. Are we we're actively involved in that? With their next one, they haven't had one for a while, but yes, we're actively involved in that, and we are actively involved with the and their biannual conference, users conference that is uh, initiating in July. Okay. When we first developed this project, was there an anticipation or, or expectation that that cyber would play a role as as an independent set of eyes on on uh, uh, on the work or, or what Infor was telling us, or, or was that not anticipated as part of this program? It's a good question, uh, Councilman Miller. So the, the difference between the two is the Infor people we were dealing with are not the consultant implementers. They were using cyber as the implementation arm. It's not as though Infor has implementation team and then cyber had their own. It was one implementation team, that is cyber, and the methodology is cyber's methodology, so not the INFOR methodology and the INFOR resources on there, except where and if needed from a development perspective. So the only opinion for and strategy with respect to implementation was going to be coming from cyber. Now, with respect to um, this change and the acquisition of the cyber INFOR product for our project, the commitment is to keep and maintain the cyber methodology to implement it so that we're not shifting gears, um, but to also take advantage of where Infor has resources that cyber doesn't. We now have those more accessible to us. Well, I would think under the prior arrangement, you could have a situation where a problem developed and, and Infor blamed it on Cyborg and Cyborg blamed it on Infor, where, where under the current arrangement that, that shouldn't happen because you're de dealing with a single entity. Is, is, is that correct? Dale, you hit the nail on the head. I have had that before. 
And in those situations, even though they're partners, there is the not my fault, your fault. And, you know, you can lose time. You lose weeks of time of this back and forth volleying the ball as to who's responsible. Now we have one responsible vendor for the success of our implementation. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. Please proceed. Okay. I've touched on the project schedule briefly, but I'll, I'll touch on it again. All of the blue are, are, represents our phase one implementations. And you can see we have multiple modules initiating and going live at different times. That core first module of core financials and procurement really establishes the foundation. Very much following that after um, that production is budget and planning and then extended financials and procurement. Public Works, as you can see, we're already kicking them off. They're training today. They are going to go live very close to the core financial and procurement implementation. So we have staggered core uh, implementations and then the additional modules rolling out after giving that core module some st time for stability and adaptability from our end users. Any questions on this schedule? The schedule is very definite and specific, so we're going we're gonna to be able to know whether you're keeping this on schedule or not. You'll see movement will highlight and identify any movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Thank you. All right. So moving on to the county investment, and this is, uh, these are numbers that were baseline numbers utilized last year and what you saw as a a committee. What I want to point out on slide 30 here, this is our original, um, the original baseline budget. So everything here, uh, th this slide and the following slides are based on that baseline project budget. They have not yet been adjusted to reflect any type of variance or potential expected variance. Um, at this time, we will be working on that in the future as we really start to dive into this project. Since we're still on the front end and in the maturity cycle, we're you know at what a third, uh, three percent or four percent of our spend. But we are um, we're going to be ramping up quite significantly both on the consultant side and our team side over the next uh, few months. So the next time we present in front of you, you'll see some variance numbers. But for today's uh, purposes, these are the baseline components um, presented last year. So of the overall 25 million, we have this bucketed into consulting services, software, staffing, which includes uh, temporary or backfill staffing, hardware and contingency for the project. Are there any questions on that slide? Yes. Okay. Councilman Trump. Yeah, we're looking at $25 million of overall, uh, and that's just the cost of the equipment and the software. Uh, staffing is the training, so the, the, there's no, is there a time in there for lost time from when an employee is, is not doing their job? Uh, from a functional nature, but they're in the process of training. Is that is that budgeted in here? As far as backfill type of, do they yep. need backfill to train? Yeah. Those numbers have not yet been factored into this. Okay, so that's going to go higher than this, more than likely, if you're going to have to have some backfill going on simultaneously. We actually have, a, we budgeted for backfill, so the backfill requests are going to come at different times in the project. So we just received our first backfill requests, truly, from Public Works as they start kicking off. So it's a gradual process to build up what t what are those positions that need to be backfilled and for what duration. So we do have a budgeted line item for overall and we'll, um, each of those requests will be going to the steering team, first to the project team, then the steering team for approval of those amounts. Is it included any place that we could see it? I, I, you, sh you show this slide number 30. Uh, is there a backfill slide someplace that would show us the total 
uh, funding. It's, uh, it's yes, going. for each of these, yes, it does. It shows okay. you by year and by category, okay. by what are the details under each of these categories. Could you provide that then to I, us? I certainly can. I'll be happy how higher, how much to higher take is that. that go in this, in this slide? How higher? You, you, you indicate that each one of these categories has a backfill component to it. What is that? What's the cost of that backfill? So the only item on this slide 30 that has backfill is item that's indicated as staffing. I assume the staffing is the one is where the backfill is coming. As it has new hires and staffing. That staffing is that backfill staffing is the temporary hire. Okay. Right. If you can just tell us what that number will be and how high it's going to go. And then, oh, excuse with, me just a moment. Yeah. I, could. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear you saying that the, uh, that the temporary backfill is, is already embedded in the number that you have here. And, and so unless right. there's uh, an unanticipated change it's already budgeted for, is that correct? Correct. correct. Oh, so that it's is the correct. five point. It's already in, yes. It's oh, okay. already there. I, okay, it's then. already. It's a portion of that. Yes. So it's the already there. Yes, okay. and it's All broken right. out. I don't, I don't need that. Then I okay. just, if it's included, if I I guess I wasn't looking at you have temporary and then you have something going on in addition to. It. But if you're saying that's all inclusive, what do you think is the length of time based on? I can't read the slide number because it's, it's darkened out on ours. But it's the drive benefits for employees and man, uh, managers. And you have productivity improvement. You have faster processing time. Mm -hmm. You have uh, online versus paper. So those are dollar things that I can uh, identify. What's the length of time at this budget it's going to take by those things to pay this off? So we don't have that estimate yet because the business process changes have yet to be decided. We haven't gotten there in the project yet. But once we implement those due processes, no procedures, the functionality of the um, implement ERP is taken advantage of to allow all those efficiencies. We have to be in production. Typically, ERPs are in production um, within one to two years before you can pull metrics and really see where that efficiencies are gained. But we must have figured out that there's a range from high to low that we would see the productivity gains, the faster processing time, the improved online versus paper that would translate to some dollar value roughly before we would go out and spend the taxpayer's money. What is, where do we show that number? Uh, I don't show that here, but let me ask if from a historical perspective, if that was created. So we have, have not looked at it from the business perspective other than high estimates possibly, but uh, I'll let Scott see if he, he can be any provide any historical details. Yeah, well, I, I would like to see, I would like to think that we went down a path that said <laughs> that these are the drive benefits for employees and managers, and that's going to translate to some benefit for ultimately, we have drive benefit for employees and managers, I hope taxpayers uh, is, could have been added to that. And so therefore, I'd like sure. to see before we went down this path, what was it we expected to see on behalf of the taxpayer? under that benefits for these things. Yes, that uh, you know, certainly will take that time for a future. It's, Thank it's you. A, a estimate that working with the business teams where that business process transformation is going to occur and what they believe that will be, we can certainly work on that over the next Well, I understand when months. you get implemented, it's going to confirm your estimate one way or the other, whether you're high, low, or in between, or dead nuts on. But there ought to be some place before we started this, before we asked to write a check for this amount of money to go out to get these bonds, that there was some expectation that we're going to get a payback in some length of time, X period of time, by doing these things. Uh, I'll go back and confirm where where those details may have been and what those were Thank so you. that uh, we're prepared to talk next time. OK, great. Ms. Baker. Um, just to follow then up Ms. Brown. on I'm sorry, thank you. Just to follow up on that line of thinking, um, the expectation for the return on investment, which I believe is what Councilman Schron is, is saying, mm -hmm. the um, once we get past 2018, which is only the end of next year, the investment to continue 
what the costs are to make sure that everything is up and running, the updates that are going to be needed, um, just the overall scope of future needs of uh, making sure that this program continues and is who knows where we'll be in five years, ten years, uh, and, and what type of uh, technology will be um, needed for this. How I, I guess I was under the assumption that the savings through this program would then pay for whatever is needed to continue it. But um, are we saying that the savings will also be on the investment and will pay for uh, whatever is needed to continue on this program? So the savings expected for the ERP is in a couple of different categories. So when we talk about, let's talk about the technology <clears throat> savings, we are, uh, the goal is to sunset, which is decommission of a number of legacy systems, systems in use today that are being replaced by the ERP. So that is a process to sunset, and we don't sunset the day we go live. There's a process to sunsetting afterwards. So we still need those resources and the, value and the um, support structure to decommission those systems. And so we're still looking at doing that in parallel, but we won't finish dis decommissioning the systems fully until after the end of 2018. So the last one to be decommissioned would be those HR related systems, but we will still continue to move through 2017. So what that means is while fiscal and procurement are live in INFOR, we also have this team that has supported the famous and by speed and all having to work on the dismantle and archiving of that data. So we still have those teams in play as well. It's not an immediate shutdown. The same thing will be happen as we go through the process of decommissioning and sunsetting um, SAP when we get to the end of the HR components. So where do those numbers, you know, how rapidly <coughs> those systems are sunset and can be archived, the data can be archived, gets us to our numbers quicker. But they're, again, it would be through 2017 and into 2018, rather, before we're sunsetting those. So those operating costs offshoots, we really won't recognize, again, just from the technology side. Now, when it comes to the business side, the business teams have some resources in their departments today who support some of these systems as well. So we have to factor in that. How are those efficiencies gained? Do, you know, were there other opportunities within that department for those individuals to be repurposed to and do something different? But we will not know the full gains on those business processes either immediately. Okay. Uh, Ms. Brown. Uh, I guess the one question I had was just the back to the original slide was the contingency, how that figure is calculated, how we come up with that number? So good question. The contingency that we looked at it, we looked at this project and when, when they went out to the best and final offer last year, we looked at the requirements were, you know, a good three to four years old. And what we found is there's very limited documentation about certain systems right now. So the risk was significantly high, was, was assessed as high of there being multiple unknowns as we discover and dive into this um, project, something of this scope and this size um, that may require uh, change orders with respect to additional functionality or additional interfaces or additional reports that may be needed of, of scope that just was never discovered during that <coughs> process. So when we look at contingency, we looked at what is the possibility and the, the probability of scope change? I don't want to say creep because scope creep is different than, you know, you like things you want to add versus discovering requirements that, that are required and needed but never part of that process. So we believed that was high. So that was certainly there. And then there are other variables as well with respect to the data archiving system, the data archiving um, process 
and then the connectivity of bringing all of the end users together. So we looked at it holistically as to here are the areas, technology, services, uh, product, and scope. There's, there's key areas that likely will need change requests and potential additional dollars. That's why the contingency was added. Okay, please continue. Okay. So the second slide, slide 31, really talks you through what have we spent this year between 2016 and May 18th of 2017 of that budget. So those first three you can see we've spent uh, dollars in consulting, staffing, and software acquisition. And then I also have to at the bottom of the slide, what is it that we expect to spend between May 18th and December 31st? Again, based on that baseline budget that has not been adjusted since, um, since its initiation. So by category, you can see that we have expectations of, of spend in consulting services, staffing, again, staffing and backfill, software, hardware, and contingency. Yes. The next slide, 32, also addresses the, what is the expected spend through 1231 of 2018. These are the remaining costs as we move into production during the first quarter of 2018 and uh, resources become less intense from the vendor perspective and most of the uh, foundational components are in you can see our shift of the budget is less in 2018, expected to be less in 2018. Ms. Brown. Yes, Ms. Miller. Cindy, if the um, contingency funds are not um, used fully, where, where do they return to? That's a good question. Scott, do you, can you answer that question? We're assuming just the general fund. As slide 33, I know um, I was asked to say, what are the expected savings in the next two years as we get ready for budget purposes? And because this is as, as a, a capital project, we'll still be in engagement, still be rolling out in 2018, and 2019 represents the year where we'll be sunsetting some, some systems, but also le level setting, going through the learning curve of our employees and then starting to establish our metrics around process and procedure changes and the impact of those procedural and process changes to the overall budget of the county. So we are not anticipating savings, at least in the next budget cycle. Yes. Ms. Brown. Thank you. Okay, given that point and then all the, the large amount of contingencies, who authorizes the contingencies? Who's who's authorizing those funds? The steering team. The steering, the steering team. team. Yes. If a, if something is uh, has is an unbudgeted item and it all has to go to the steering team, or if it's new scope and as a change order, the steering team has to um, approve those items. Hmm. So, I'm not sure that. That was the answer I was hoping for, but okay. Okay, Ms. Baker. Uh, thank you, and I, and I guess that's um, my prior question. The efficiencies and no expected savings for 18 and 19 is certainly understandable given your explanation, but there's life after 19. Do you, uh, can you give us any idea or have you looked at 20, 21, 22 to see when we would level out and when we can expect to see uh, significant savings to go back to our uh, return on investment? Yes, we are looking at it. Uh, we need to look at it holistically, Councilman Baker. And what we've done so far is we've looked at it from the technology side. So if we sunset certain systems in 2018, what that potential savings could be, what if we sunset them in 2019 and beyond? So we certainly have some proponent just from the technical side. From the business side, until we have the metrics and we have the realized, whether it's six months to a year, to have that comparison to current to, to um, new, to say, was it 500,000, was it a million, two million, because our procurement 
processing time was much more efficient. We're not there yet. We still have not, from the business teams, we are not there yet in their analysis to that degree. To, f to follow up on Ms. Baker's question, without putting a number on it, between the uh, operational savings that could be achieved on both the technology side and, and the business side, do you think it would be f a fair assumption that there would be some expected savings in 2020? That's a possibility. We just don't have all the details around that, Dale, yet. Um, if we only have one of the components, it's it's a challenge to say if how big that bread basket is or how small it is. Okay, please proceed. Okay. <coughs> We're almost home. All right, so on the last slide here on slide 33, while no expected savings, some of the common <coughs> areas where we expect to see and result in, in savings are in our contracts whether they're um, technology contracts to shut down current systems. We have a number of systems to be um, shut down. Also services, for example, consulting services that are participating in support of these systems in any way, shape, or form, or other consulting services that the business teams may um, employ based on some deficiencies of support as well. Business process and services, now this is really going to depend on these conversations and the decision making from each of the business areas that we really aren't, haven't hit yet in the project life cycle, but the efficiencies in the design and the decisions are gonna be critical to how, you know, what shakes out from a savings perspective. Also looking at repurposing of our staff. So while maybe there isn't a need for 17 data entry clerks anymore, but based on the advanced um, functionality of, say, um, adding performance management, training management, and succession planning, those resources may be able to be repositioned in doing something else within the department or elsewhere. So there's certainly things to look at in that category. And then attrition. That's something that I've seen happen on, in a, on every ERP project, and it happens <coughs> you know, across the board it, with people you don't expect and you don't want to lose and others that, uh, you know, that you had no idea were, were going in, down that path. So attrition is one that, that is something that we'll look, like a, look at as well, but sometimes that does thin the, the path as well. Yes, Ms. Conwell. Through the chair, so with the attrition that is going to occur as this moves forward, I must, would like to assume that the succession planning will be implemented some kind of way so maybe we won't lose, we'll be able to not lose maybe some, some good employees. I mean, I'm just... I know attrition is going to occur as the efficiencies, but you talked about succession planning occurring in um, phase two. So I'm just wondering if yes. those are going to co collide a little bit so we can actually see who we're losing. You know, maybe some of those individuals that we don't need that area anymore could actually succeed up to something else. So I'm just hoping that all that is correlating some kind of way. And, and even though succession planning module will not be in place for phase one, the steering team and the team leads are already working on identifying those people who are critical to their departments, who they want to make certain that they retain through this process. And so part of the discussion with the steering team is each of those teams, when they've identified their resources, they provide those details to the steering team member who then meets with HR, right? Douglas, they're meeting with a Douglas. Some of our staffing numbers, we did estimate some need for potential retention for folks and uh, that, that's what we're using and moving through that process in phase one with the steering team and uh, core teams as well. Because right now, people are already being identified as there's concern that they might leave, so we want to retain those folks, at least through the end of the project, maybe even further. So those efforts are underway. 
So the the individuals through the chair, the individual employees that um, may face attrition, how are we keeping them in the loop or? Well, when I say attrition, sometimes the, the, the term we're, we're using too is people will self-select out. Mm -hmm. So I, um, just an example I had with a, another very large public sector entity and um, the gentleman who ran payroll, who was critical core team member for me, had been there for almost 40 years. He was the person who actually created their payroll system to pay, you know, 40,000 employees. He was critical, critical path resource. And as soon as we started the training and the implementation process and, and what it would involve, he retired. He, you know, some of the attrition is self-selecting out. He retired, but, he, you know, his conversation with me was he just couldn't get it in his brain. He, his brain, he said, worked on programming hands-on and cobalt, not something like an ERP. So Pete, when I say attrition and the way I, in context I use it here is people will decide to leave for whatever reason, and we have to have awareness. We are trying to be on top of that right now with the teams by having them identify and escalate and have those conversations with the steering team members and with HR as to how, you know what can we do to help retain them. And we had line item budgeted for that as well. I know I'm moving forward that's, that's gonna occur, uh, but then there will be some that will be let go because we no longer need them. So I just, just HHS coming out at me, just how we do that, how that process, you know, and that they're kept in the loop. Because uh, it won't be all retirees or. You're right, they won't be all retirees, but what we're looking at it and that repurposing is because today's processes are paper and people intense, data entry, spreadsheets, trying mm -hmm. to, you take that away and everything is automated, but now mm -hmm. there are 25 things that your department has not been able to provide to for okay. a service to your customers. And now that repurposing of that staff is, they're there, you know what? Mm -hmm. You train them and they make sense to stay in your department because they understand it and they are the ones that you're not training, teaching them about the culture and about the, the, the company, but you're giving them a new skill, mm -hmm. helping them to advance. And now you can do things like have a consistent per performance management system. And now you can plan for succession planning. So not necessarily resources going away, but how do we reposition them? Because now we have, we've gained a lot of efficiencies, but we had so much on the back burner. And let's bring those things off the back burner because now we can address them. So those are the dialogues that we're having, at least at the, uh, at the team level. I have one additional question on the 2018, 2019 estimates. And you look at this project, there's, there's the $25 million cost, which is the one-time implementation cost for the system. Uh, but in addition to that, there are going to be ongoing costs involved in running the system on an, op on an operating basis. And my question is, uh, is whether for 2018 and 2019, whether it would be reasonable to assume that, that the operating efficiencies that could be achieved would be sufficient to offset the additional operating costs of running the system so that the net effect is zero? Or, or, are, or would we have to assume that since uh, not much in the way of savings is achieved and, and you're operating a new system that there might actually be uh, be a negative amount for the first couple of years. As far as the latter, because we will be still have those legacy systems moving through sunsetting process and data archiving, we are going to have the original operating spends for those systems, at least to a degree, 
while we have the new operating expenses for the ERP. So we're going to be running that dual course through 2018, um, really focusing on those two paths um, going like that means we're going to have expenses for both new and existing. Maybe lessened at the existing, but we would have both paths going on through 2018. Can you get us a number for 2018 as as to how much additional operating expense you think we might have? Sure. I You want that before the next one or the next meeting, or do you want me to present that at the next meeting? I would like that as soon as you can get it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Ms. Baker. Uh, thank you. And just as a, a kind of a wrap-up, and that question I didn't word it as well as you did, but that was the question I was trying to ask also. And I understand the parallel systems, and we have twice as much information going in, so the savings. But but where do we start seeing that savings? And I, I think your question was directed better than mine. Um, just one question before we end, and I know some of my colleagues in Board of Control um, hear me ask this, and I don't ask it anymore because I'm not quite getting the, the answers I was thought I would hear. But if you could... I'm going to ask you broadly, but then give you a specific example. Uh, when we're asked throughout the departments specifically for technology spend, um, is that something that you are in, engaged with? Do you know that when we're in the Board of Controls that a certain, and I'm going to give an example. I kind of went through my, my, some of my agendas. Department of Technology, Department of Information Technology asked for about 60000 for two Cisco servers, two Blade servers, chassis for video infrastructure upgrade. Do you know that the, that the Department of Information Technology is asking for that and that this fits in the scope of the work that you're doing in the ERP? So I have awareness of some of the components that are going to the Board of Controls through IT. If anything is going to be for the purpose of the ERP, that is something that those items have to come through the ERP. First, to make certain that um, there's a, the awareness agreement and, and that I'm helpful for the process. May I follow? I guess I struggle with how could it not be how could it not be part of your ERP if the whole thing is tangled with each other, that you can't have one department, or maybe you can, working in a silo, that they always have to be inter interconnected. And if there's a department that is asking, whether it's public works, whether it's um, Department of Te Information Technology, I mean, there's it's a variety. We spend a lot talking about um, technology upgrades, how could it not be somehow interrelated to what you're doing? Good afternoon. The uh, great question. The We have weekly meetings as IT leadership, so we do have uh, all the directors, uh, Cindy and myself included, do meet weekly to coordinate strategies. The areas that do have overlap from the ERP, as an example, would be SAP. That's actually a big cost saver. So we've actually formally have a dotted line. So actually Cindy, even though she's doing the ERP, she actually has dotted line responsibility for SAP to make sure she has visibility to the activities, the planning, the budgeting, and of course the sunsetting that we all are excited about to get to um, over the years. So so the, the items it may have been an anecdotal example, but that's actually on the network side. So in the hardware and software side, which, which have different roles and responsibilities, Cindy's intimately involved in that and, and in many cases has formal reporting relationships outside of the ERP with, with my SAP being one example to make sure that we're coordinating those effectively. And so we're looking at them pretty closely and we're, we're pretty cost savings driven. So we're trying to drive these down pretty aggressively. So there shouldn't be any concern when these are brought to us in Board of Control that it's not a, that it's not just a, we need this because it's something that we need for our department and we don't, you know, we're not really coordinating, but it's something that's needed. I mean, the question of have, has the ERP people, have you talked in broader terms before this was brought to us 
I, if I'm hearing you correctly, the answer is yes. I, I feel comfortable about them through the budgeting process, which it has to go through prior to that. We've already, um, at the front end of the budgeting process, made sure that it aligns with our other visions and put a lot of pressure to manage those costs down. Uh, for example, we have some HR issues we're working with. We are reluctant to invest in SAP, but because of some um, recent reporting that have come out and some concerns that were in HR, we very reluctantly are investing to shore up some shortcomings in that area. But we're watching it very closely, that overlap at the budgeting process. Um, and then, uh, again, as we administer it and, and we meet weekly and, and Cindy has reporting lines to the areas that overlap with her in, in most every instance. Just one follow-up. The public works and their recent ask for archiving, shelving, and storage units um, for the Halley Warehouse archive, is that, again, another component that has been reviewed? And, I mean, that's a pretty huge ask. I just wondered, is all that, don't worry about it. We've, we're, we're in it, we understand it, and we're all coordinating efforts. This is not money that is isolated in its ask. Great question. To clarify, within the technology realm, we are coordinating very closely. As it relates to the archiving and the paper, um, at this juncture, we're not intimately involved with um, what will be in a couple years. We're hoping a largely or certainly substantially more paperless environment. Um, we do have a variety of other out of the innovation team. We are looking at some opportunities to reduce how we archive and, and better leverage some of our technology like we've got, we've invested millions in document management and things like that. So we are looking at that area uh, more broadly, but but know that the coordination is not nearly as, as close as uh, amongst the technology uh, areas, but that is an opportunity for us. Ms. Ms. Trippi, could you uh, go over the last slide that you have regarding uh, future Board of Control requests. Certainly. I wanted to just make you have awareness, provide you with awareness that we will be continuing to come to the Board of Controls for additional expenditures, things that you may be seeing in, um, in the near future for data, data migration and storage, also for technical foundational item servers and access controls, <clears throat> consulting services through third-party assurance, and then backfill resources for key project team members. So those are the key items that we are receiving requests in for, gaining um, estimates for, and will be expect to be presenting them in the near future. When you uh, send these items over to the Board of Control, uh, Could you provide information as, as to whether this was an item that was included in the original base budget or, or, or whether it's something that was, uh, was not anticipated and has to be funded out of the contingency? Whether it was new or it was a line, has a line item. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll do. If I may, that was my exact question, so thank you. Okay. I would be in I would like to know that, too. Okay. We think alike. Yes. Uh, I can certainly do that. Okay. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank both of you for the uh, great amount of time and effort that you obviously spend in putting a comprehensive presentation together. Obviously, there were uh, a lot of unanswered questions, uh, that's a good thing. If, if that were not the case, it, it would mean that we probably didn't really need to do this, uh, but the questions mean that we did. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Before we close the meeting, I'll ask if there's any questions about any part of this that we may have skipped over that anyone wants to ask before we call it a day. Okay, here are none. Excuse me, Councilman Miller. Yes. May I make one point of clarification? I believe uh, Councilwoman Brown had asked a question about the contingency funds uh, um, and what happens if we weren't to use those. I, I do recall that they are actually revenue. Uh, they are certain bonds with restrictions. So I think our answer, which was the general fund, uh, needs to be amended to be that it's actually, it would have to be um, examined on what is, based on the conditions of the bonds, what is the permissible use of those. So we'd have to re-examine that. Just okay. a point of clarification. Thank you. Okay. 
Thanks. I was actually kind of surprised by the answer in the first place, so I appreciate that clarification. I'm going to keep him back next time. <laughs> it's already been clarified in the email to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, well, I want to thank you for the opportunity and look forward to um, coming back and seeing you on a quarterly basis. We'll, we'll probably uh, have our next one three months from now in, in early September. We'll want to get that done before we uh, start into budget later on in the month. So, so that would be the time frame for that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, is there any miscellaneous business? Has anybody signed in for public comment? No, Mr. Chair. Is there a motion to adjourn? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed?